In this section, I'll discuss how we value stocks. In this particular video, I'll discuss the impact of future cash flows on valuation, and then I'll introduce the concept of multiples valuation, or market multiples, and then I'll describe the situations where market multiples is most appropriate, and then finally, we'll discuss some problems with market multiples, and then actually calculate some market multiples using the example of Macy's. Let's begin. Now, our goal in stock valuation is to identify stocks that have a higher intrinsic value per share than their market value per share. In other words, we want to calculate the underlying value of a firm's free cash flows discounted to the present. And if we find that value is greater than the price per share of that stock on the market, we want to consider investing in that stock. In other words, if we've identified an undervalued stock, then we should expect that the holding period return of that stock should be larger than that predicted by the cap M because over time, what we're going to see is that the value of that stock on the market should trend toward the intrinsic value of that stock. In other words, we should expect a positive alpha if we find that the intrinsic value per share that we calculate is higher than the market value per share. Now, there are several factors that are going to determine a stock's valuation. And I've mentioned these already, so this should be a bit of a refresher, but the first factor that will determine a stock's intrinsic value is the future cash flows of the, the security. So if you own shares of a stock that has a very high level of expected free cash flows, then we should expect that the intrinsic value of that stock should be pretty high. The second determinant of the intrinsic value is going to be the discount rate or the rate at which the firm can raise capital. So we're going to be discounting those free cash flows that we expect in the future by a certain discount rate. And we'll talk about how we calculate that discount rate. And it'll depend on the model in a later video. And then the third component that we need to take into account is the risk of those free cash flows. And the problem here is that those cash flows aren't guaranteed. They can fluctuate through time, and so they, we expect a fair amount of risk associated with those cash flows. Now, one question that gets brought up is, how do we estimate these free cash flows and our discount rate? Well, the answer is, we tend to look at the past performance of the firm, and we use that to determine the expected future cash flows of that firm's stock. So we're going to use some historical data as well as some forecasted data. But before we get into the discounted cash flows approaches, which I'll, I'll go into much greater detail on in the next video, I'm going to focus on the market multiples approach or the comparable multiples approach. This approach assumes that a firm has the same growth prospects as its direct competitors. And what we're going to do with this measure or this metric or this technique is to compare the valuation ratios of one firm to either the industry average valuation ratios or the valuation ratios of its direct competitors and determine whether our firm, the firm that we're analyzing, is more highly valued or less highly valued. And if they're less highly valued, it might be a case that they are undervalued. So what we're going to do is we're going to multiply our firm's profitability or sales or some other metric by the valuation ratio of some direct competitor or group of competitors. And that'll give us our intrinsic value. Now the big benefit of the market multiples approach is that this approach doesn't require us to estimate future cash flows that will accrue to us, the investors. This is absolutely the biggest benefit of the market multiples approach and the discounted cash flows approach it forces you to estimate these cash flows but if you have a firm whose cash flows are very hard to estimate then that can be a problem and that's where the market multiples approach comes in very handy so let's talk about the ratios or the valuation metrics that are going to be most useful to us first we have the price to sales ratio and so this valuation metric is going to be very useful to us when we're trying to value startup firms 
or firms with negative earnings. I said in a previous video that the price to sales ratio is good because every firm is going to have positive sales. So this means that our price to sales ratio will always be positive. Another ratio that we'll use is the price to operating cash flow ratio. And so this is just price per share or market price per share divided by operating cash flow off the statement of cash flows. And this is of all these metrics, I'd say this is probably the one that I found to be most accurate in predicting future returns or future alpha of a stock. Next, we have the EBITDA ratio. And the EBITDA ratio, again, is just enterprise value or the market value of the firm's equity plus its debt minus its cash, all divided by EBITDA, or earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. And then we can also use the PE ratio. Uh, price to earnings ratio, this will be a good metric for allowing us to calculate the intrinsic value. We can use other valuation multiples, but these are, these are arguably some of the best. The issue with the PE ratio, however, is that if we have negative earnings per share, we really can't use this ratio. All right, let's talk about how we use the market multiples approach, and we'll, we'll actually go ahead and use the PE ratio to do so. So when we want to calculate the intrinsic value of a security using the market multiples approach, our goal is to get the intrinsic price per share of our target firm. To do that, we're going to take the earnings per share of our target firm and multiply that by the PE ratio of a direct competitor. Now, the important issue with the market multiples approach is that we need to first identify an appropriate direct competitor. That is the big hang up in the market multiples approach. That's the most important factor when we're calculating the intrinsic value because we're just, we're taking some metric, in this case EPS, of our target firm and we're using a valuation ratio of their competitor and essentially copying that valuation ratio onto our target firm's earnings. So what we're going to be left with is, once these EPSs cancel out, an intrinsic value based on the current earnings of our firm and the growth prospects of, our, of that firm's competitor. And we typically, if we're choosing between historical PE ratios or historical earnings per share versus forecasted earnings per share, we, we generally want to use the forecasted earnings per share, which is just the projected earnings one year out. This is what analysts are going to recommend. And so that, that's what we'll try and do in the future. All right, so let's talk about how we use these ratios to calculate the intrinsic price per share and the, using the market multiples approach. So let's start with the EBITDA ratio. Now, the EBITDA ratio, when we use it for market multiples is a little different than all of these other ratios. We're essentially, when we use the EBITDA ratio, calculating the intrinsic enterprise value of the firm. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our target firm's EBITDA, so the, the EBITDA of the firm that we're trying to value, and multiply that by the EBITDA ratio of a direct competitor. Or if we don't have a good competitor, we'll, we'll take the average of a set of competitors. And once we multiply those, the EBITDA ratios will, we'll say they cancel, and what we're left with are the growth prospects of our target firm, or sorry, the growth prospects of our competitor copied onto the profitability of our target firm. Next, we have the price to sales ratio. And here again, we're going to take the price to sales ratio of our direct competitor, multiply that by the sales per share of our target firm, and that's gonna give us an intrinsic price per share of our target firm. Price to book ratio works the same way. We take a competitor's price to book ratio or market to book ratio, multiply that by the book price per share of our target firm's shares, and that'll give us our intrinsic price per share of our target firm. Final example, price to operating cash flow. So again, we're taking the price to operating cash flow of our direct competitor, multiplying that by the operating cash flow per share of our target firm, and that'll give us our intrinsic price per share of our target firm. Now, there are a lot of issues with market multiples, and I, I cannot stress this enough. The most important consideration that you have to make with the market multiples approach 
is the comparable firm, the competitor. If you don't identify an appropriate competitor, your intrinsic value of your target firm is going to be way off. I mean, if you're trying to value, let's say, Coca-Cola using Macy's as your comparable firm, your intrinsic value is going to be worthless. You would need to use Pepsi as the comparable firm. If you're comparing, let's say, Kroger, you would want to use a company like Marsh. Or maybe even, uh, if, you, if you had nothing better, maybe Walmart, although Walmart is more of a discount retailer, so maybe that's not the appropriate comparable firm. That's the first big issue with market multiples. If you don't have a comparable firm to use, you might as well just scrap this entire process. You, you really can't even accurately use market multiples. The second big issue is the issue that comes along with accounting earnings. In accounting, we have these techniques that generally fall under what's called earnings management. And earnings management is essentially the management of earnings to achieve some goal. So the classic example is that let's say a firm needs to, or the, the CFO wants to meet or beat earnings expectations of analysts. What they might do is they might change the accounting procedures of the firm in order to, in this quarter, increase the earnings per share or the bottom line of the firm and therefore and in that way the firm doesn't underperform analyst expectations and the firm's share price doesn't fall as a result. Uh, so this is a big well-known issue with respect to accounting statements. You can alter your, your accounting choices so you might change your uh, inventory method from LIFO to FIFO for example. Or there's, there's literally thousands of other changes you can make with respect to your accounting principles. Uh, so uh, earnings management is a huge concern, and this is what makes us somewhat distrust any earnings or a lot of the, the line items that we see on the financial statements. There are some other issues here. First off, reported earnings fluctuate. So if we have one firm that's reporting its earnings in March of a year, and then a recession hits in the latter two months of that year, so April and May, and then a com their competitor reports their earnings while taking into the account the effects of the recession, that's going to throw off our market multiples approach because one firm has already suffered the effects of a recession while the other has not. So with all of these issues, what I'm trying to convey is that when you're using the market multiples approach before you just go out and calculate the intrinsic value using that very simple formula that I showed you you need to be absolutely certain that you're using a comparable firm whose fiscal calendar is relatively similar and you want to make sure that neither of those firms are manipulating their earnings too severely. There's actually several models that you can use for that. There's something called the Jones model of earnings management. There's also the DeChow et al. model that you can use. Uh, there's lots of uh, methods you can use to test whether a firm is managing its earnings. All right, now let's try an empirical example. So what I'm going to show you is how we would value Macy's using the market multiples approach using real data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use all of these multiples to calculate the intrinsic value of Macy's but remember, the most important consideration when using the market multiples approach is the comparable firm. All right, so let's move over to Excel. So here I am in Excel, and I took this data as of 10-20-2019. And obviously, as of the point in time when I'm recording this video, several of these firms have actually defaulted. Uh, JCPenney defaulted. Uh, but hey, the, this historical data is still good. So let's go ahead and we have Macy's and what we're going to do is we're going to work down here in the yellow area and calculate the intrinsic price per share of Macy's using each of these firms as a direct competitor and using each of these ratios. So let's start off with Nordstrom as the direct competitor. And we want to value the intrinsic value of Macy's using the trailing P.E. ratio. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 
First, Macy's earnings per share, and since this is trailing P.E. ratio, we're using Macy's historical earnings per share. And we're going to multiply that. Actually, let me lock that in first so we can copy it all the way across. We're going to multiply that by the trailing P.E. ratio of Nordstrom. And here is the intrinsic value of Macy's where we've copied the growth prospects of Nordstrom onto Macy's historical earnings per share. Our intrinsic value is $37.54. Uh, we can compare that to Macy's current share price, which is $15.12. All right, let's go ahead and copy that all the way over. All right, so notice here that we have a value error, and that's because, well, JCPenney, their earnings per share is negative, which means that their trailing P.E. ratio is going to be left as a blank. Uh, so that's why we have a value error here. We are going to leave this as a blank. All right, now let's get the intrinsic value based on forward P.E. ratio. So here we're multiplying Macy's forecasted earnings per share, and I'll lock this in so I can copy the formula over, by the forward P.E. ratio of Nordstrom. Make sure you copy that in the right place. And I'll copy that all the way over. And notice here, sometimes investors will actually choose to report a negative forward P.E. ratio. Uh, it'll That'll differ. I mean, some will, some won't. But in this case, we actually have a negative valuation because JCPenney is forecasting negative earnings per share over the next year. Next, like, let's get the PE, the intrinsic value based on the PE rate, price to sales ratio. So first we have the sales per share, which is up here. I've already calculated that for you, and I'll lock that in by putting a dollar sign in front of the letter, and we'll multiply that by the price to sales ratio of Nordstrom. And we will copy that over. Next, let's do this with respect to price to book. So I have book price per share up here somewhere. Here we go. And we will multiply that by the price to book of Nordstrom. And I will lock in the Macy's value. And we will get the price to cash flow intrinsic value, and we need the operating cash flow per share of Macy's. Here we go. I've already calculated it for you. I just pulled the operating cash flow off the statement of cash flows and then divided by number of shares outstanding to get this. So I will lock this in and then multiply by the price to cash flow down here. And I will copy that over. Now let's calculate this using the EBITDA ratio. And so I need EBITDA of Macy's, which is in millions, this will be, this will be 2 billion. And so I will lock that in and multiply that by the EBITDA ratio. All right, so now we have almost all of our intrinsic values per share. And then we also have the enterprise value per share of Macy's, or the intrinsic enterprise value of, per share uh, of Macy's. And that's going to be in billions. Uh, now, before I discuss these findings, let's go ahead and convert this number, this enterprise value, into a price per share. And remember that the enterprise value is the market price per share, or rather, the enterprise value is the market cap plus the market value, which is approximated by the book value of the firm's debt, minus the cash on hand of the firm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take 
the intrinsic enterprise value minus the debt and then add in the cash and then I'm going to divide that by the number of shares outstanding and that will be right here and I'm gonna lock this in before I close the cell and hit enter so let's just lock in these and scale it across and there we go now we have all of the intrinsic values that we could possibly have. So really, we have a huge range, as you can see, of intrinsic values here. So this is why I said over and over earlier in this video that the most important factor to consider is the comparable firm to use. I mean, if we're valuing Macy's, then I would argue that probably Kohl's is probably not a comparable firm. Kohl's, as far as I can tell, they typically operate out, they will have stores outside of malls. Uh, they might sell slightly different clothing. Uh, JCPenney, I think, is probably the most approximate competitor here. Uh, but, I mean, Dillard's might also be appropriate. Uh, I mean, quite frankly, before we usually start this process, we want to identify the closest possible competitor. Now, regardless of what competitor we use, I mean, I, I would argue that perhaps Dillard's is the, the closest competitor. I mean, these, these valuations are not exactly uh, hopeful. I mean, we see a large number of valuations, particularly when we're using JCPenney as a comparable firm that indicate that uh, Macy's is uh, overvalued if the share price is currently $15.12. So just for the heck of it, let's see what Macy's share price is as of the time that I'm recording this video, which is August 19th of 2020. So here is Macy's share price as of the time that I'm recording this video. A, about 10 months after the date that I collected that data. So as you can see, Macy's share price was certainly has decreased to $6 and about 55 cents. Uh, I mean, I, I guess there might have been some value in uh, saying that JCPenney was the closest competitor. I mean, Dillard's, if we're using Dillard's, uh, had valuation metrics uh, generally above the current share price. The problem here is that we're seeing a lot of dispersion in the intrinsic values. And when we see something like this, let's say we were to start out and only use Dillard's as our comparable firm, and we get a range like this, this would mean that we would want to perform some additional analysis. You know, determine is Dillard's the most appropriate firm or are there some factors that make Macy's uh, somehow better or worse than Dillard's? Uh, if so, I mean, quite frankly, we might want to uh, take into account some other valuation models. Uh, so valuation models are not perfect, as you'll see throughout this, this section of videos. I mean, valuation models, they really just give us a range uh, with which to work. And so this is why we, we use a large number of valuation metrics because no one valuation metric with a comparable firm will give us the perfect intrinsic value. Okay, let's wrap up with a CFA level one question. So you are evaluating a security which is actively traded and followed by many analysts. Based on your model, you arrive at an intrinsic value which is much lower than the current market prices. The sensible course of action will be to A, reevaluate your model, B, place a large buy order, or C, place a large sell order. Well, in this case, your intrinsic value, the value that you calculate using, uh, we'll say, the market multiples approach, 
is much lower than the market price. Now, if we were absolutely certain of this intrinsic value being accurate, we would want to sell our shares. Uh, now, the issue here is that the value is significantly different than the market price. That would make me as an investor a little concerned and I would absolutely want to reevaluate my model or even even look at additional models before I actually made any placed any orders. So the answer here is actually A. Remember, no valuation model is perfect. You will find some valuation models give you some wildly crazy intrinsic values. So always double check your work. Always try a variety of models, and in the case of market multiples, always do your best to identify a perfect comparable firm. All right, let's recap. First, our goal in valuation work is to identify undervalued and overvalued securities. We do that by comparing the intrinsic value to the market price per share. If the intrinsic value that we calculate is greater than the market price per share, this might be a case where we want to buy the security. And if we find that the intrinsic value is less than the market price per share, then we might want to consider selling or shorting that security. Next, I introduce the market multiples approach. Now this approach is the best approach for us when we can't value or can't estimate future cash flows. And that's a huge problem when we start to talk about de novo firms, firms with very high volatility in cash flows, or firms where there's just not enough data out there to estimate cash flows. So keep this in mind when you're dealing with firms that are not blue chip companies, we're generally going to have to fall back on the market multiples approach. Next, the most important factor in the market multiples approach is the comparable firm. If you don't have a perfect competitor firm, then the market multiples technique is pretty worthless. Although you can combine firms or take the average of a series of competitors, but usually that's at best a stopgap. Finally, you're not only ever just going to calculate one valuation metric using, let's say, the market multiples approach. You're always going to want to calculate the intrinsic value using several valuation ratios. Uh, so the issue here is that there is no way we're ever going to be 100% accurate in our valuation. We want to see a range of valuations based on a range of metrics. If every intrinsic value that we calculate is saying that our firm is 10% undervalued, that might be a case where we want to invest in that firm. If we find that those intrinsic values are all over the place and some are higher and some are lower than the market price per share, that would be a case where we want to reevaluate our valuation model, maybe run a couple more valuation models, consider some additional factors, uh, etc. So with that, I'm going to wrap up, and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you.